several minor tasks to perform, one of which is to survey a little more of the historical side of alchemy, this time by paralleling the rise of alchemical tradition in North Africa <coughs> and its development among the Chinese. Chinese alchemy is quite different in spirit, methodology, from the European approach to this subject. And because of its comparative antiquity and the way in which it developed, we may have a clue to the obscure origin of European alchemy. We've already noted that the great rise of the alchemistical symbolism with its extravagant the use of emblematic devices and elaborate formulas coincided with the rise of the other mystical schools in Europe and should not be regarded as an engine as is popularly supposed. Now in China we find what may well be uh, the building up of the pattern that finally led to the rise of European symbolical alchemy. In China, this mystical art is associated with the cult of Taoism. So we'll have to examine for a moment Chinese philosophy, where in China, alchemy stems directly from philosophy, a link which we do not have in the West. We're not sure of the relation of these groups. But from the study of the Chinese, we may well begin to re-evaluate our Western historical approach. Taoism arising as the result of the teachings of the obscure Chinese philosopher Lao Tzu passed through three distinct stages in its development. The first, the philosophical, the second, the transcendental, and the third, the theological. Uh, these periods are roughly divided into about six to seven hundred year periods. Uh, each of these sections would thereby correspond to something resembling 600 years of development and systematic uh, re-adaptation. In the first 600 years of Taoism, the sect was essentially philosophical and essentially a very high form of Eastern absolutism. Uh, Lao Tzu was not only a mystic, but a very profound theist in his interpretation <coughs> of the essential principle of Tao or universal being. How many had lots to pass on before his followers, disciples, and several other Chinese scholars who became distinguished in the descent of the system? began to expand and elaborate the essential principles which he had taught. This period of expansion resulted in several recensions of the basic texts of the Jews and terminated about the beginning of the Christianity, or shortly thereafter. During this first period, we have a parallel with the first period in Buddhist philosophy, which was essentially a powerful ethical agnosticism. Uh, but gradually, it became evident in popular usage uh, that the abstract principles of pure philosophy did not have sufficient vitality for masses to result in any strong development of sects or groups. The pure philosophy was simply too deep for the average person and did not come close enough to his own living experience. Therefore, the gradual transition took place in which a series of compromises by interpretation increased the uh, romanticism of otherwise abstract mystical learning. So beginning around the 1st century AD and continuing to the 5th, 7th century, Taoism passed through what we would call a transcendental or purely metaphysical period. And it was in this period that alchemy arose among the Chinese. And it arose among these Taoist monks and scholars and sages 
would be done to think as much as this man concerning the essential teachings of the original uh, master, the ancient master. If universal consciousness, which was the goal, was to be achieved by man, then there must be certain methods or means whereby this consciousness can be more closely associated with the human being. And the Darwinists, taking the attitude based upon um, a very brief statement in the Therapy King, <coughs> came to the conclusion that Dao was a universal life agent, a universal principle, existed in everything but was more abundant in some things than in others. Therefore, in order to increase Tao with all consciousness of life being within the individual, he should gradually associate himself with those things in which this principle was most abundant. We come very close to the Paracelsian theory of Luna. The certain living thing had a larger share of this essential energy than other things. We believe that in a different way on a scientific level today. We believe, for example, that certain foods contain more nutrition than others. And to the Chinese, nutrition, the essential element of nutrition, or basis of it, was God or life. Therefore, if we are a little bit unhappy today over overly refined sugar and overly refined flour and various homogenized dairy products because we doubt their vitamin or vitality content. So the Chinese in this early period were speculating as to the essential abundance or deprivation of nutrients or nutrition within the various elements of food and the various foods uh, <coughs> concentrating Tao within the body of the human being. So we began to speculate like this. What are the principal ways in which energy can come to the person and be distributed throughout his body and nature so that he may unfold or grow or come nearer uh, to the full uh, expression of his Tao content? And the Chinese came to several conclusions. They divided this field into three essential parts. The first uh, they called breath. Now, the moment they began to talk about Tao and breath, they began to come very close to the yogic systems of India. They held in China that Tao was in the air, and therefore that to inhale was to accept Tao into yourself. This is the breath of life, or the living breath. Air in its eternal circulation was symbolical of the endless motion of the Tao principle in the universe. So well, the problem was to increase the intake of air, which they did by various disciplines. Also, through the development of esoteric arts, uh, to use the will or the consciousness to distribute this air within the body so that it could be more rapidly brought into direct contact with vital organs nerve centers and brain centers. Uh, they started in, for example, with a formula like this, that the disciples had struck in by inhaling and then counting his heartbeat <coughs> before exhaling again. <coughs> he could start by inhaling, holding his breath, and counting his heartbeat up to 100. At which time he should exhale. By doing so, he would increase uh, the duration of the energy principle from the air, which remained longer within him. Also, at the same time, if he gathered more uh, negative or useless material to be disposed of. In other words, the Chinese referred to this process as body cleansing through breath. They held that the sage, through practice over a period of years, could finally reach the point where he could hold the breath and count it to 1,000, which would be quite a long time, probably two or three minutes. And also, during this period of time, uh, would accomplish what they call body cleansing. Now, the second part of breath was 
But thou is absolute reason. And you can uh, let, estimate the parallel between, for instance, this Chinese policy and Western calisthenics. You can see a good Westerner get up in front of the window, open it up, be down these chairs, take a deep breath, and back to his clothes. This is the way of doing everything. It's not subtle, by any means. But then the West is not subtle. But the Dalai was subtle. So he told them what to do. He said, before you do this breathing process, you should take a feather and suspend it on a very fine thread or hair about six inches in front of your face. And in the process of both inhaling and exhaling, you must not disturb the feather's motion. You mustn't cause it to swing or sway or move. In other words, you must both inhale and exhale very quietly, without any sense of pressure. You must not hold the breath until you've done it, and it all comes out in one fell swoop and will blow the feather across the street. You have to do this all very rhythmically, very subtly. There must be no obvious breath. There must be no obvious exertion. It must be gradually to bring this process completely within the control of the will. And the breath moved so quietly, so silently, so subtly, that only those who were well acquainted with the system could even detect that you were breathing. Thus breath becomes absolutely smooth, as the Chinese call it. And by so doing, you have less and less human interference with this motion or rhythm. So the breath was one way in which they thought to cleanse and transform the internal part of the body. Now the second thing they recommended was, of course, diet. And in the case of diet, they had some very strange ideas. For example, the Chinese rejected all grain. Instead of wheat being the staff of life and all that type of thing, they rejected grains of all kinds, the five grains which they knew. They said that, they, that the grains were detrimental to the bowel. They in, uh, in, insisted mostly upon fruit and green vegetables and foods that were exceedingly light. They thought that any weight of food within the body, even though this weight might be of a very solid and substantial nutritive quality, was too coarse, too uh, mundane, uh, to serve the purposes of Tao. That the universal energy principle found in plants was most easily assembled directly from a living plant that was uncooked, and that it was also assembled from the plant itself, rather than from its fruit or seed. That was the stalk, the stem, the leaf, the flower even, was more abundant in Tao than the, than the final uh, consummation of this plant in its fruit or seed. Because in the process of transforming into its final fruit or seed, a transition occurred in the nature of Tao, and it was not so readily available to the body. Thus the Chinese held that universal life could be quickly taken in to certain kinds types of plants and plant life. And in their mystical speculations, they listed a number of food products uh, which were exceptionally powerful in this uh, element of Tao. <coughs> now the third um, phase of their research dealt with what they called discipline. Having uh, used breath as one means, and used food intake as a third, as a second. The third was the actual use of the mind and the consciousness itself to draw or collect out. We then come in again to a very mystical expression of their concept or doctrine. Not only did they use the attention of consciousness to draw this energy, but they then moved this consciousness throughout their own bodies, directing Tao and distributing it by a voluntary action of the will. But whether it was the food, or the breathing, or the consciousness, it all had to be very rhythmic, very subtle, with a minimum of action of, of any kind, a floating of life upon the surface of action. Never for a moment this tremendous intensity with which we associate activity in the West. Now the purpose of these three disciplines was uh, the achievement of the mystery of immortality. And this corresponds very largely with the Western alchemical concept of the elixir of life. This mysterious substance uh, that if uh, properly prepared and properly uh, used 
was the wrong life in Bethlehem. The Chinese have an old character who lived, according to their records, probably around the thousand years BC, who was their equivalent to Methuselah. He's supposed to have lived 800 years. And he's supposed to have lived almost entirely on Tao. In other words, he was maintained by an invisible energy in the air. And these uh, Chinese scholars were quite confident that by means of a complete adjustment of their own bodies, their minds, their emotions, their diet, their breath, their thought, a complete adjustment with Tao or universal life, that if they could become like immortality, they would be immortal. And there are many legends in their mystical writings concerning these wonderful sages and saints, like the old teachers of the Jade Mountains, who have gained the incredible longevity, simply nourished by Tao, or as they would have called it, by the elixir, or the magical agent, the mysterious power of the universal life principle. Even the Chinese used the term medicine or substance or elixir to represent this Tao or the free uh, energy in space. Now this approaches another level of principle, very close to European alchemy, except that yet we are not catching very many of the alchemical terms that we know. Uh, the Chinese term of for universal medicine is very similar to the alchemical. But we do not have the paraphernalia, we do not have the retorts and the bottles, we do not have the laboratory and the bellows, and we do not have the elaborate alchemical or chemical formula symbolism, which we have in Europe. But the end to be attained is almost completely the same. Now this was the first of their concepts in relation to alchemy, the possibility of the attainment of an eternal life, the medicine that heals all mortality and when obtained uh, by the mystic, makes him immune to the evil in the world. Not only is he protected against sickness and age, but he is protected against the evils of any creature that might attempt to attack him or endanger him. He is indestructible because he is identical with Tao, because the interval between himself and universal life has been reduced to a minimum. So, years ago, when I was traveling in Korea, I went into the Diamond Mountain area, and there, had the opportunity to contact a few uh, elderly Taoist scholars. Um, you can't say, probably, that they belong to the same pattern as we find on beautiful old uh, Chinese paintings of run wonderful rugged mountains and waterfalls and old scholars seated under the tree. Uh, they did not have quite that amount of glamour, but from these uh, men themselves, and from legends and lore in the community, we could get a pretty good picture of how things were a thousand or fifteen hundred years ago, because things were slow in those countries. It was a well-attested uh, records in that, uh, in that region, but many of these old scholars were about a hundred years old, and in probability they were. And one look at them would well testify to extreme longevity. There were rumors that some of these have been fifty. And while there was no particular point of the fact that they would ever be immortal, they certainly had exceeded the average person's span of life. They had extended usefulness. Most of them did not require any of the aids that we need in order to keep functioning even at 70 or 80 in our way of life. Uh, one of their principal concepts there was that uh, the secret of longevity is the reduction of friction. And friction must always be the resistance of a personality to the law. In other words, Tao is reality. Those that move with reality flow as little ships upon the surface of a spring and placid river. Those who go against the law immediately come into conflict. And the moment there is conflict, there is death. There is friction, the wearing out of things, the exhaustion of resources, the wasting of energy. It is not what we do that wastes energy, but the way that we do it. And also the hazards, mental and emotional, with which we burden the things we do. An individual in the West has an unpleasant task to perform. He worries about it today before he does. 
He wishes he didn't have to do it. He tries to find some way of pushing it on someone else. And as the time becomes nearer and nearer, he becomes more and more sorry for himself because he is faced with this burden. By the time the actual task arrives, he is no longer really in good condition to face it. He has dissipated more energy in vain regrets over the circumstance that would require to solve it. Then after it is finally completed, he continues to be sorry for himself and then develops a gradually and heroic attitude in which he goes from then on recounting to others the extraordinary the serenity and this extraordinary courage with which he faces the disagreeable <laughs> This uh, is a tremendous waste of energy. And the Taoist would simply advise that the person relax and pull through the circumstance, whatever it is. Face it. Face it without qualms, face it without regret, face it without fear. Whatever it is, it is. You do it as well as you can, working with a complete state of relaxation so that every faculty and power that you have is available. You are less likely to make mistakes. You are less likely to make a wrong decision, or a hasty one, or an over one, and in all probabilities the incident itself will almost evaporate as it approaches. Because you have failed to make it important. By so doing, you will conserve energy and kept the law. Well, these uh, old Chinese scholars say that the answer to all this is simply relax. That if you meet all incidents, simply a factual. Simply things to be done next, regardless of whether you like them or do not like them. You take all of the pressure out of them. You take all of the tension away from yourself. And as a result, you accomplish more, uh, you enjoy better health, and no matter how busy your life may be, you have time to sit in your bamboo grove grove and write poetry. Uh, the Taoist monks who have watched Europeans in China and in other countries uh, in their way of life, point out that even the busiest man in the West could sit in his family grove if he wanted to. If he only did the things that he is doing now, but did them with absolute lack of tension, he would find that instead of taking all day, it would take two or three hours, and he could write at least one extra poem every day. It depends on how we do things. And in Taoism, the smooth way, the quiet way, the peaceful way of doing everything, is the way of immortality. It is also and the best preventive preventive we know for answers to the serious difficulties of our modern life. So all of this lies into one pattern, and that is the Darwin's concept of the possibility that man, by special knowledge, by arts, by sciences, by the investigation of natural law, should finally achieve eternal life which they regarded as not impossible, although they did not claim that they had attained it. They did claim that they had found ways of extending life, which would indicate that the ultimate goal could be accomplished if man's consciousness was brought into absolute harmony with the universal plan, so that full and complete union with reality would mean not only the end of sorrow, the end of pain, but the end of death. This was their belief. We may assume it or not assume it as we please. Now the second thing that was a big concern in China, and has always been a big concern in China, was poverty. In China there is no middle class, as we know it, and never has been. There is the rich and there is the poor. And the poor are many of the rich few. And between these two, what we call our great white, white collar class in the West has no existence. So in the second degree of the concept of uh, art, magic, sorcery, metaphysics, the Chinese developed the idea that comes the closest to the Western alchemical tradition, and that is the transmutation of base metals. He believed firmly that it would be perfectly possible to make gold. Why? Because gold was a symbol of doubt. Gold, as the most precious of all substances, was an appropriate emblem of reality, the most precious of all things in space. As the gold represented the light of the sun, the light of reason, the light of wisdom, the light of truth, so gold represented the great treasure. 
Although on the mystical or philosophical level could be wisdom. Because wisdom is a kind of wealth that exceeds all the wealth of the earth. Truth is a treasure greater than the most precious diamond. Reality is more valuable than the scepter of the purest jade. So all these great and wonderful realities, these truths, this wisdom, all these became associated with the concept of gold. Now the gold, in turn, was associated with the concept of being the king or ruler of all the matters. So Shanti, imperial heaven, was yellow and brown. And yellow was a color which, rising in the Taoist period of Chinese metaphysics, <laughs> became the emblem of the yellow road of heaven. It became also the emblem of the imperial house. It was the sign of supreme power. And yellow and gold were religious. So the great goal for Chinese began to develop a concept. If a man should live forever, or would live forever, the practical Chinese would say, as long as he's living forever, he's going to be poor forever. You just can't, you just can't do anything. You can't get anywhere on that philosophy. And uh, if uh, you think about the Chinese for a moment, you realize that with all their philosophy and all their art, they're very practical people. There is a person in the world shrewder than a Chinese merchant. Now, in China, of course, uh, a, a well fed person who shows a reasonable amount of rotundity is regarded as almost approaching a divine state because they're so few of them. Therefore, one of their basic symbols for happiness in this world is to be fat. The fat person is happy. Because you cannot be fat without having something to eat. And in China, an individual who has something to eat is a superior man. He not only is most fortunate, but he must be most clever, or he wouldn't have found a way to get something to eat. The way it was the worldly power, worldly affluence, all has to do with food. And food, in turn, all has to do with money. So on the physical plane, the Chinese, being always a practical man, Instead of uh, doing what some of the Western religions uh, have done, and that is develop methods of medicating for prosperity, he started to go into uh, the transmutation of metals. And, believe it or not, way back in that period, the Chinese hit upon mercury as being the most important metal or element in connection with their transmuting process. And they associated mercury with a substance called cinnabar, from which mercury could be abstracted. And so cinnabar became the basic material with which they worked in the effort uh, to gain uh, the secret of the transmutation of metals. They had no laboratory such as we know, as we've mentioned. And uh, your opinion of an old Chinese alchemist, if he looked back in that period, he usually represented a little man seated under a tree somewhere, with a very tiny little stone in front of him, probably about the size of a suitcase, and looking more like a moderate sized incense burner than anything else. And in this stone, there is a little furnace he had, a little cup in which he was working all these materials, and he certainly was not in mass production. He was working in a very small space with a very small amount of something. But he was very busy and just as conscientious and absorbed in his activity as any Western chemist. But he didn't have a great number of materials. He didn't have a wonderful pharmacopoeia to call upon, or shells with bottles and all those things. He was more or less working with one little container, one little group of, of substances, which he probably carried a little box in his sash or something of that nature. It was all done on a very personal and intimate scale. But he was looking for a means of transmuting base metal into gold. And he held that the reason he knew it could be done was because, on the level of philosophy, his own base metals, his person, could be transformed. If he, as a person, could be transmuted from a state of ignorance to a state of wisdom, then on the level of the metals, base metals must be susceptible of changing. Man can change. Man can perform the alchemical mystery in his soul. 
And that which is possible to the soul, by analogy, is also possible to the body. So the Chinese alchemist was convinced that the rules and regulations by which he could achieve his own identity with Tao could be used to bring all base substance into an identity with Tao, which was Tao. It never occurred to him for a moment to question that this group of analogy uh, was essentially correct. Now, aren't we having the last great many accounts of transmutation? So we also have in the East. And there are many old dollars hermits who are supposed to have been able uh, to go on <coughs> indefinitely, performing great and wonderful charities, and by means of the gold which they were able to manufacture. Now, there was a really element that came in connection with this. And perhaps this had a bearing on it, although we're not too sure of all the elements involved. Unfortunately, we had as much knowledge of Chinese literature as we have of Roman. <laughs> it was probably a change the course of Western civilization, but we don't have it. In the Dalloway's work, the problem of the production of medicines under magical formulas for the curing of various diseases developed very rapidly. The Chinese had a strange and rather eccentric uh, group of meditations, but they still were quite true, quite wise, and quite gifted in their ability to treat many ailments for which we have no immediate solution. But in their medicines, one of the most important and priceless ingredients, particularly in their mystical remedies, was gold. Well, you know, as we all know, that it would probably have been very hard for Socrates to have gotten a gold if he had wanted to do any chemical experimentation. He probably never had the price of, of one small Greek gold coin, or at least very seldom had it. <laughs> Green old chemists working with various medications in China were monks. They were poor persons who had renounced worldliness, so called, to go into scholarship and study and meditation. Gold was for the emperor, not for the monks. Gold was not for an old hermit somewhere among the mountains, unless he happened to be fortunate enough to live in an area where he could maybe mine a little gold or carry a little gold himself. For the most part, he had no contact with these elements. Therefore, to him it was necessary to manufacture them. And there is a legend or tradition that the Taoists made gold for the purpose of their medicine, not for its own sake, but because they needed it as an ingredient in something else. Not being able to buy it, not being able to afford to get it, and not being likely to receive it as a gift and under the economic conditions of China. They had to learn some way of making and manufacturing either gold or a synthetic material which had the same attitudes. But in the course of their experimentations, they also manufactured synthetic stones. They uh, manufactured synthetic jade and amber. They perfected a great many um, chemical formulas as the uh, European alchemists to gradually enrich the entire uh, code of uh, chemistry through their various researches in related fields. So we have the second of the two desirable things. One is the elixir of life. The other is the transmutation of metals and the formation of synthetic stones, which is the equivalent of the philosopher's stone. So they were working on the same basic story, but they came about it a little differently. Now we have continued to exercise a comparatively powerful influence in China, especially in this uh, metaphysical field, until about the 7th or 8th century, when it began to tangle with the newly rising strength of Buddhism. Buddhism has been introduced in the southern China about the beginning of the Christian era. Some say slightly earlier, some say slightly later. But there probably was an indeterminate foundation in the first or second century PC and a permanent foundation about the second century AD. So the Buddhism was coming in. And Buddhism uh, was already also passing through a transition period. Buddhism moved into China about to cross. But it began to expand its own transcendental doctrines, moving from the philosophic foundations to its own metaphysical foundations. 
And this is a period, Buddhism came in with quite a different viewpoint from that uh, which was in China at that time. Buddhism also brought a certain amount of alchemical and chemical speculation with it from India, where for a long time, the scientific research had been more or less intensively carried on. A little later, however, after the rise of Naranda and some of the great institutions in India, uh, that Buddhist scholarship in art and in science, especially in chemistry, began to drift towards China and began to mingle its stream with the indigenous culture. Actually, there is not a great deal relating to what we call alchemy in the original Buddhistic philosophy. There is, however, a great deal about the philosophy itself, which is, which is reminiscent of the original concepts of Tao and the Chinese uh, belief in the possibility of man's final identity with an eternal state. But it was not in the Buddhism so much an eternal life as it was an eternal consciousness in Nirvana. But in its transition from one part of the world to another, in the gradual rise of what is called the Northern School, or the Kala Chakra, <coughs> Buddhism began to take on a great deal of transcendental culture. And so for the time it was centered in the Northern group, uh, the rise of Lamaism in Tibet, and the rise of the uh, Great Vehicle, and the Pure Land sect in China. There was a lot of speculation going on, a lot of metaphysics drifting into the Buddhist philosophy. Buddhism, much like Gnosticism and Neoplatonism, had an absorbing quality about it. And when Buddhism struck the alchemical tradition in China and in adjacent countries where this tradition was developing, it immediately accepted it and imposed it upon its own doctrine. So that there came to be an alchemical or alchemistical interpretation of Buddhism also. And this particular phase of the subject is still very largely taught in the colleges of the al sect in Tibet. And these colleges, among their other magical uh, rituals, the magical studies, um, include the transmutation of metals, the development of a universal medicine, and the, in, the indefinite prolongation of life. Now, all of these ends, as they were developed by the Chinese, would be rather inconsistent with Buddhist philosophy. But when Buddhism moved into a strange area where other philosophies were already present, it, uh, it became mingled with them in a kind of alchemy of its own. And as a result, there are many doctrines now to be found within the Northern Buddhist schools especially that have very little in common with the original teachings of Bhagavan. They represent the minglings of tradition from one school to another. And who are working with this, going even into Japan, where Buddhism and other groups, and even Shinto, have some alchemical tradition, we gradually observe the Eastern group uh, to be concerned with alchemy or chemistry almost entirely on the level <laughs> of a means or a method for accomplishing one of the three great purposes of European alchemy. And the two we have mentioned, namely eternal life and wealth, has a third added in the course of time. And that third is the gift of vision. It was very important in uh, these systems that the neophyte uh, or the disciple should eat of the speech of <coughs> eternal foresight. In other words, the power of immortality implied with it also a complete and eternal knowledge of all things happening everywhere. An ability to uh, mentally announce the future, uh, to uh, examine into the deepest secrets of the world and of life. And therefore, there had to be some mysterious uh, elixir of vision by which the entire mystery of life could be unfolded uh, to the uh, fortunate possessor of this wonderful substance. 
There's another interesting uh, phase of this in the Taoistic concept that also we will later with Buddhism. And that is that somewhere in the mysterious hinterland of things, there is a place where the genii or the spirits or the immortals dwell. There is a mysterious, fabulous land far beyond the reach of the average person. And here, the wonderful beings of Lucy and little figures of Portland and bronze and wood today are were supposed to have an actual existence. They were the sages who had eaten of the beach of immortality and had gone off to join the city of the immortals, where the scholars and the mystics and the alchemists and the magicians all lived together forever in eternal bliss. Somewhere beyond those mysterious mountains that encircle uh, the great Middle Empire. So you are would be alchemist, you are mystic to come. Believe definitely in the intercession of the, those who had already achieved the mystery. Because when you had immortal life and eternal wisdom and all wealth, you were a kind of super being. You might come floating down out of the sky riding on the back of a plane, for example. Or you might step off of your familiar dragon in front of his house someday and explain to him all the secrets of life. They people definitely had the belief that there were spirits, and that these spirits possessed these secrets. In Europe, you had the same thing because you had elementals, and Paracelsus even believed that you could get the, you could capture and hold these elementaries or beings, that they could give you the secret of the stone and all these wonderful and mysterious powers that had to do with the control of the elements of nature. So we now have the same the perfect one, the mysterious elder, who has the stone, and who becomes the equivalent of the European adept. And the Taoist adepts are these wonderful, pleasant-faced old gentlemen with long beards and high foreheads. They're associated with wonderful creatures, dragons and griffins, and uh, wonderful birds and beasts with knotted staffs and crooked sticks in their hands and carrying bottles and carrying baskets and carrying bags in which all the paraphernalia and wonders of their knowledge um, these was all conceived. Sometimes the genie would sit down on the bag and the bag would fill up in space with him. It was anything you wanted. It was magic. And in this second period of Taoism, everything was magic. And magic also could cause you to communicate with these beings. And these beings could take you to the city of the gods, and there they could teach you this mystery of the stone. They could give you the secrets of and bonders that you had sought for so desperately and so patiently through the years. So this phase of the alchemical tradition in China parallels very closely after Europe. Uh, the beings in Europe were not quite so fantastic, but the essential principles were the same. That it was possible for you to be, receive instruction from a master of the art would already achieve this. Because in, al in alchemy, it's perfectly possible for you to share knowledge. You lose nothing by it, the other person gains. But his gain is not your loss. Therefore, there is no particular reason why you shouldn't help him. In China, then, we have all of this tradition building up and growing and developing. And it finally comes out to us after maybe 32,000 years in what we call the day flower arrangement. Uh, whether in the Morbana school or the Ikinobo school in Japan, the arrangement of flowers, the tea ceremony, all of these things, the incense ceremony, all have to do with the same principles, the same rules, the same ideas that underlie the Taoist concept of that. So we'll take a little time to go into that and we'll try to show you exactly what is intended. Now, we mentioned in the uh, Western tradition the, uh, the presence of three essential elements which must be united or brought together in the mystery of the stone. In the West, they're called the king and the queen and mercury, or sulfur, salt, and mercury. Now, in the Chinese concept, the sulfur is called heaven, uh, the salt is called earth. And the mercury is called man. And the great triad in Chinese philosophy, and it finally uh, came into European thought also, 
Here's the triad of heaven as a man. This triad goes through all of their art, all of their sculpturing, all of their painting, every phase of their cultivation. <laughs> and the reason, for example, in Kenny Musar, knowing that art, that instead of having the wide margin of a picture at the bottom, as we have it, they have it at the top and the narrow margin at the bottom. When we frame a print, we always frame it with a longer margin below and a shorter margin above. We think it's more artistic that way. When we print book pages, we always leave more margin at the bottom of the page and less at the top. Whereas in the Orient, they do exactly the opposite, because the upper margin is always heaven, which must be superior, and the lower margin is always earth. And then between these is the work of art, and this is man, because man is the work of art, and art is skill protecting nature. So heaven and earth and man must always be represented. Heaven is above, earth is below, and the art has painted the picture in the middle. Therefore, he is man. And in this particular very interesting old mandala here, which is about 11th century, uh, from the Nara period of Japan, you will find down here among the demons in the bottom of the picture is painted with the artist. A little portrait of the artist. And who did the picture? You can't see it. I am covering up the artist with all that. But sometimes. <laughs> But the heavenly earth and man is a bottom, a leaf, and a bud, and is the basis of all flowers, because it must all be triadic. Heaven and earth and man is sulfur, salt, and mercury. So in producing all of their artworks, therefore, everything that they do is a formula. These formulas are so exact in Chinese art that it takes 500 years sometimes for one of these schools to permit a master to go to the extension of adding one more blossom to a street of cherries, cherry flowers. There must be just so many, and it's a major division and major rise within a school if one more petal is added to a flower. Everything is so completely circumcised and integrated under rules, complete canons of law. In Taoism, therefore, we have this over concept of Tao, containing within itself, within its own eternity, heaven, earth, and man, which also returns to us in the Confucian doctrine, and of course returns again very definitely in the Buddhistic triad, uh, where you have the three great principles. You have Amitabha, or uh, uh, the great the Supreme Buddha, then you have Avalokitesvara, and you have the three or Sattva. And these are heaven, earth, and man again. They are spirit, body, and form. Now in this painting, spirit is above, probably represented by Chinese paintings. Below is matter. In the middle is form. And here you have form, a magnificent composition. Now form is your chemical combination. Form is your alchemy coming in. Because in, in this central part is a formula. And a formula is a pattern in form. You can almost uh, sense the meaning of it from the word formula itself. <coughs> a man is a formula. The stone is a formula. The human soul is a formula. And in the oriental system of art, it is always taught that the picture, the representation, must always be an absolute synthesis of the formula. And the formula is always balance. The formula is always equilibrium, it is always synthesis. China, therefore, picked very quickly upon the three great systems that arose within its own country and created a triad out of Confucius, Lao Tzu, and Buddha. And these were the three famous vinegar tasters of the old Chinese paintings. These three represented the schools, have an American man again. And in this emphasis, you have the problem of equilibrium. And in alchemy, the great problem of equilibrium is the balance of the formula, or the balance of the compound. Because if you bring heaven and earth and man together in exactly the right compound, you have immortality. You have the stone. You have the universal medicine. You have the mystery of all knowledge. And you have complete equilibrium, which is the secret of God. If, therefore, uh, the Chinese began to experiment with this concept, they believed that the great hermetic miracle 
was placed or was uh, was taking place within the great glass bottle of the universe. And upon this bottle lay planted in Egypt the seal of Hermes. So that we refer to it now as the hermetically sealed bottle. Meaning in this case that nothing can get in or out. But originally it merely meant that the bottle used in medicine and science were stamped with the mark of Hermes as a sign of the purpose of the experiment and also uh, as a proper sign of medicine or the healing art. Within the great bottle of space, the universal or eternal experiment was taking place. This experiment was the generation between heaven and earth of man. Now this generation did not mean man just as a human being. Rather in the Hindu sense of the word manas, meaning the mind or the soul. Actually, the great transmutation was the union of spirit and matter to produce the mystery of soul. A man, because in him, of all creatures visible and knowable to us, we have the only obvious example of soul. And because man is able only to examine himself firsthand, and all other things secondhand, and because man cannot find soul in anything else, because he can experience only himself. Therefore, he became the symbol of the mystery. He became the symbol of the mysterious agent in which the compound of the opposites was achieved in the complete sublimation of universals. Man, therefore, receives from above by the hermetic symbol of fire, and by the hermetic symbol of fire, he receives an influx or an internalization of spirit. From the earth beneath him, he receives the ascending uh, influx of matter. Therefore, he has a body derived from the elements and a spirit derived from the stars, as Pelotonus has said. And between the elements and the stars, between the earth and heaven, move the orbits of the sacred planets. And these are the seven metals from which the mystery of the soul is compounded. So man becomes the living soul. And as soul, there is achieved within him the equilibrium of spirit and matter. Now to bring this equilibrium to bear upon the alchemical formula, the absolutely true center of the interval between spirit and matter must be found. And this is again revealed to an, on another level of symbolism which is just as perfect and just as extraordinary and about which someday I hope we will be able to, uh, to talk at greater length and that your music symbolism. The Pythagoras steps uh, step to my board between the orbit of the fixed stars or heaven and the surface of the earth or the elements. And he caused this cord to be marked along its way with frets to break the cord or to break the uh, uh, string of the one string instrument into the harmonic intervals. And he placed one fret in the exact center of the string, by means of which he secured the mystery of the octaves. And in so doing, he placed this fret in the position of the sun in relation to the solar system, the way the ancients studied it. So that he caused the absolute point of equilibrium of tone to correspond with the body of the sun. And he caused this in man to correspond with the spiritual nature of the heart. And this sun, therefore, we come to again in alchemy. And from the salt and sulfur, the opposites, mingling together, we have in spirit united to matter, the middle distance or meridian of form, the octave point on the thread or cord. 
And here we have the sun, which is the focal point of the world form, form being the perfect compound of spirit and matter. Now, as the sun occupies this mysterious central point, the sun is therefore gold, because the sun is produced alchemically in space by the mingling of the opposing elements. And all of the great work of heaven and earth is achieved in the production of the sun or gold, the core of the great world of metals. In this way, the philosophy of alchemy says that wherever there is absolute equilibrium, there is a sun. And that all planets and all other bodies are off balance. Wherever there is the sun, there is equilibrium. And the moment this equilibrium occurs, the sun becomes creative and causes to move from itself a series of unbalanced polarities and forms a solar system. And when the units forming this solar system are are key balanced within themselves, they each become a sun, they each become a sun and generate again. Now in man, uh, the Chinese say, he receives his spirit from the imperial heaven, the yellow emperor. He receives his body from the great mother. He brings these two, spirit and matter, into equilibrium and produces a sun, as you have. And this sun is the soul. And the soul is therefore composed of gold. Not physical gold, but the same kind of gold that is always created by equilibrium. The moment equilibrium is created in the alchemical mysticism, the gold within a thing is caused to be released. Because wherever there is soul, there is a potential equilibrium. And as I think I told you on another occasion, <coughs> recent doorknock in Switzerland has shown that uh, gold, colloidal gold, is a sovereign remedy for ailments of the heart. Heart, sun, gold, soul. They are all part of one sequence of values. Now, according to the Chinese, there is gold in everything, just as the Europeans have. Now, what is the goal in everything? What is the seed of goal that must be always be present in every single thing that exists? The answer is that everything has within it the potential of equilibrium. All things have the possibility of being synthesized into balance. Now, if you remember in the Sabah Zohar, the Kabbalistic Book of the Splendors, it says, Unbalanced forces perish in the void. Thus passed the kings of Edom and the giants of ancient days. Your titans, your chaotic giants, fighting uh, for control of the universe, represented your two great powers, the mother father dragon in China, that struggle together and produce between them the golden ball, which is the symbol of imperial China and also the symbol of the age of the world. When ether and chaos among the Greek philosophers, the Orphics, struggled and strove between themselves, they finally formed a whirling mass, which became the golden egg of Phanes, which burst forth to release the Logos in the creation of the world. So from the strivings, from the struggles of the unbalanced elements, came again the golden egg. Now the golden age on earth is the age when there was no conflict, when everything lived in peace together. This was the first and most glorious of the Yugas, the great age of the gods. It is always the same essential symbolism. And gold, silver, gold, heart, sun, man. All of these relate to this mystery of equilibrium. So the Chinese, naturally, following all nations that have had metaphysical speculation, came to the conclusion that in some way man's own nature, the etheric field, the magnetic body in order, the totality of it, 
was a box, a crystal room in which his soul was generated. And we hear in the, in the age of chivalry how Merlin went to sleep in an age of glass. We hear how the hermetic homunculus is created in a womb of glass. We have this glass, which again is the psychic field of the human being, in which the mystery of his own equilibrium takes place. This mystery of equilibrium is represented in the Chinese by the Yang-Yin combination. The circle with the twisted form in it, uh, which forms a uh, half black and half white content of the circle, but the two parts do not divide the circle evenly, but have that effect which we now recognize in connection with one of our large lingo companies, which uses this uh, yin yang symbol. And also, I believe it was used for a number of years as a symbol by the technocrats. It, uh, it is a symbol of the two half spheres, but they're in motion. So that the hemispheres appear like two sperms or two living creatures, sometimes each one with a dot or eye in it. Occasionally, this field is divided into three twisting sperms, and uh, is often surrounded by the Ponto and the, uh, the various emblems, the trigrams and the hexagrams of the Chinese uh, eating or classical changes. But this motion of God in all things is released by equilibrium. So we have the problem of bringing the human being to equilibrium. And to achieve this end, we must bring about that which is supposedly the impossible. Because alchemy begins by assuming that the first experiment means the accomplishment of the impossible. And that impossible, as we mentioned in one of the other talks, is to make fire burn in water and water support the flame. It means that we have to achieve the absolute unification of two utterly divided factors. In alchemy, they say, well, it is done because heaven and earth are man and woman. A man and woman unite and produce the sun and produce fire. By their union, they release Tao, and Tao becomes a new being and lives. Therefore, the absolute polarities can come together and do a generation, both physical and spiritual, is under the same rule. But in the problem of man's achievement of the soul, he has a spiritual seed, a spiritual profundity, a mystery that is completely free in space. The unicorn that can only be captured uh, when the virgin ties her scarf to his horn. This absolute motion must therefore come into absolute reconciliation with that which is absolute state of space. That which is immovable must meld with that which is ultimate, ultimate and eternal motion. Spirit and matter, good and bad, right and death, dimensions, up and down, in and out, must all come to an absolute neutrality. So how is this to be accomplished? There's only one possible way in which it can be accomplished, and that is by an art which is capable of dominating and perfecting the work of nature. To achieve this art, then, in the case of man, the hermetic edict must appear. The mystery must be solved through uh, the recognition of the formula of the complete transmutation. Now, in the Chinese philosophy, this formula is stated somewhat differently from the way that it is stated in Europe. And this formula uh, in Chinese philosophy is something like this. The human being has an inside and outside. These are his opposites. Halfway between the inside and the, out and the outside is a focal point, which he calls self. Therefore, self, or ego, is a movable point somewhere within the chemical field of the mingling of internal and external. Self is sustained from the outside, 
by the sensory perceptions, which are constantly contributing to its existence. Self is sustained from the inside by the descent of consciousness into specialized fields of action. So this self moves with the individual. It is a wandering point. When I look at something, I move myself into that thing. I stand in front of a picture and I enjoy it very much. Myself has gone out and joined the picture. After looking at it for a few minutes, I get tired of that, and I think of myself again, and it goes into my pocketbook, perhaps, and stays there for a little while to make them sure that everything is safe and sound. <laughs> then after a few minutes more, it uh, has another little uh, bit of danger in these code five. It travels elsewhere. It travels off into something I want to do. I want a vacation next summer, so it goes off and joins the pine trees up in the mountains somewhere while I look at it. Then the self comes back and thinks a little bit about the job it's supposed to be doing to make a living here. Then the self drifts off and identifies itself with family and friends and children and begins to worry about them. Then the self picks up the new dude in the daily paper and at this moment identifies itself with the stock exchange. This self is forever moving. Moving upon the focus of its own point of awareness. If I have a pain, my self is there. And that is why it hurts. If I have two pains at the same time in different places, my self is hopelessly confused and forgets to hurt in either one. Because it cannot be biased. If I stub my toe, my self immediately anticipates and visualizes the process of falling. When I'm hungry, my self goes out and wraps itself around the concept of food and begins to draw it towards me like a little, um, I don't know, little amoeba or something at that point, or a gastropodia of some nature. But myself is forever in motion. Today, myself has a new idea, and I think Emerson is the greatest father who ever lives. Next day, I find out that Emerson had a bad disposition, so I move over, and <laughs> my philosophy centers on Emmanuel Kant for a little while until I find out uh, uh, he took 10 years to propose to a young lady, and that doesn't sound like very good philosophy to anyone. <laughs> 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 little by little, myself moves around. Myself takes on illusions, and then he gets disillusioned, and I hate everybody. <laughs> I hate everybody but myself. <laughs> because I will never accept responsibility for what I do if I can possibly avoid it or give me anywhere else. So this self, in Chinese philosophy, can best be diagrammed by something that would look like the uh, track of an earthworm wandering through several feet of terrain. It goes in all directions. Otherwise, we think of the self as a center. <laughs> Uh, from which everything radiates, which will ever remain the same. But the Chinese and the Hindus do not. They recognize this self as something that is like a will of the wind. And it's a bow is anywhere and everywhere. And it is an untamed thing, which has to be bridled. And it has to be captured and held and trained, like the wild horses of the gods, or no one can ride it. And that in this wandering around from here and there and everywhere, there is no balance. And that the work of alchemy is to draw the self inevitably and irresistibly to dead center and leave it there. So that it occupies the position of the dot in the circle. The moment it reaches dead center, it ceases to move and everything else moves around it. This dead center is the true formula, the true point of the precipitation of the soul. Mm -hmm. Now, how to get this to dead center involves practically every system of philosophy that we know. We recognize at least seven great systems of philosophy and religion, religious philosophy for the most part descending from ancient times. These, each of them, corresponds to the talisman or figure of one of the seven planets. For the seven religions and philosophies radiate the truth just as the seven planets reflect the light of the sun. 
Therefore, the religions of the world are a series of, of formulas, of metals, which are involved in this transmutation. And whether we like to believe it or not, the essential principles of all these seven must be used to project the stone, because all these elements must release the diamond core which is in them. And the world, in its search for the transmutation of the world body or world form into the world soul, must and has achieved all that is achieved through the alchemy of the transmutation of the seven planets or the seven great religions and philosophies. They are all part of the same formula, approached on a different level. So here we have man, surrounded by his seven sensory perceptions, five active and two latent, and we have him trying to transmute the wanderers, which is the meaning of the word planet, and bring them into a focal point. And in this focal point, to generate the diamond self. Now the self, instead of being actually uh, the source of these various energies, such as will, thought, emotion, is really the focal point of their own activity. Man's self does not generate his emotions or his thoughts. His emotions and thoughts generate his stuff. Therefore, the self is often the victim of heredity, bad heredity, in this particular case. The imbalance of emotions and thoughts represent themselves to us as the crippled offspring, like the Egyptian god who was laid in his feet because of the sins of his parents. And in this case, the sins of the parents are the sins of the heart and mind resulting in the deformity of the soul. So we have the problem of getting uh, this projection of the soul, the absolute equilibrium. And in the Chinese thinking, how do we do it? We do it by following very closely upon the basic instructions of Lao Inasmuch as the Chinese insist that this wonder, the centralizing self, which is never centered, is forced out of center. That it wanders because it has to, and not because it wants to. It wanders because it is the victim of the intensity of the emotions and the thoughts. Whatever we feel, whatever we think, the self must serve. Therefore, we bind the self like Samson was bound to the new soul of the Philistines. We blind the self as we blinded Samson. And we make this focal point the slave of what we may term emphasis. It is the thing by which we attach ourselves to any given object of attention. It is supported by our own will to do these things, by our own desires, by our own strategies, by our own thoughts. And these things are constantly forcing the self out of center, forbidding it to return to center, and identifying it with some unbalanced part of its own field. Lao Tzu, therefore, taught his disciple that the thing that is necessary always is to restore the self to the center. And as the self approaches the center, it approaches the state of Tao. And as it approaches the center, it gains control of the circumference. Because it can never control the circumference equally until it is in center. How does this occur? Lao says that it occurs by the gradual reduction of the active principle, which is the term the energy field in man, or the libido. It is achieved by the individual ceasing to direct the motion of life. The moment the individual ceases to force life, in some way, or some direction, or some activity, life immediately returns to equilibrium. Therefore, illumination is not something that the individual must desperately attempt to attain. 
It is something that he is desperately attempting to prevent, even while he is constantly talking about its desirability. It is not that this path of the of Tao, the road, which is Tao, is as difficult as the symbolism suggests. It is that the individual himself refuses to walk in straight line. He refuses to permit the principle of Tao to operate. Now we can use an, 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 old, an old example taken from one of the Chinese classics uh, to point this situation. And it seems that there was an old master who had five disciples. Of course, the five disciples were the five colors, the five elements, the five provinces of China, the five everything that we have in this mystical uh, situation that we are dealing with. Five elements. Chinese have five elements. We have four, but the alchemists have a fifth, Azoth. And we have a hypothetical fifth, which we call Eta and about which we are not very certain for the most part. But this old gentleman had five disciples and he told them, he said, I want you to travel all around the world and return and tell me what you have seen. Well, in his day, that was quite a task. So it was many, many years before they all got back. But they did because they were all good Taoist disciples and they a great protecting power went with them. So after many years they returned and each one of them told the master where he had been and what he had seen. But said the master, I told you to go everywhere. You have all been somewhere, <coughs> but not one of you has been everywhere. Because there is not one of you who has visited every place. And they said to him, Master, we couldn't do it and get back. The old man said, No, my son, you couldn't do it if you started out. The only way you could do it was to stay here. And while you have all been somewhere, I have sat here and been everywhere. In other words, you cannot go there by that method. But if you attain a certain condition within yourself, you are there. Which may also explain why so many of these old mystics felt that their great service to mankind consisted of sitting quietly under a tree. Darwinism would teach that they could do more for humanity under a tree if they knew what they were doing. And they could, by running up and down the world, preaching, teaching, hoping, and fearing for another condition. Because their contribution would be on a level of quantitative penetration. Well, everyone else would be running around on a quantitative level. So in the problem of Taoism, the return of the consciousness to the point of equilibrium is attained not by the victory over self through great stress and strain, through wrestling with an angel or something of that nature. It is simply by the gradual release of the individual from pressure, from the pressure of action. Now we come to the conclusion from this that the Taoist uh, advocates a philosophy of non-action. He does. Not because non-action is negative, but because non-action is all action. There is no possible way of achieving absolute motion without passing through the state of absolute transition or transcension of motion. Alchemy says you can never unite the elements in their outer form. You have got to reduce them to essence before they can be caused to mingle. Therefore, you can never, by any process that we know, take the various elements of the personality and force them into the union to produce the stone. Before they can be created into the stone, they must all die. Paul says, unless the seed dies, it shall not live again. And Taoism says that unless action dies, the individual can never achieve absolute action. 
can never achieve absolute motion or the complete motion of God. To achieve this, therefore, he must transcend motion. And in so doing, he attains absolute motion. And there is an analogy which he gives of the axis of the wheel and the rim. And that actually, the axis is the only point in the entire wheel that has achieved absolute motion, although the rim is moving there more rapidly. The axis is the only part that has been absolute equilibrium. So Taoism is absolute equilibrium. And in the attainment of it, by the reduction of spirit and matter to their basic elements, to their basic principles, but a complete separation of them from action and inaction as we know it, <coughs> they precipitate the motion of Tao, which is absolute action. And this is the absolute stone. This is absolute light and absolute immortality of the universal medicine and the absolute source of wealth. Because all of these things depend entirely upon the individual achieving absolute balance within his own consciousness. When he achieves that balance, he then generates, he then achieves the creation of the crystal homunculus. Because out of that balance, the union of spirit and matter within himself can form his own psychic system, his own psychic nature. And he becomes a living soul with a spiritual core and a new transcendent nature or transcendent being, as the Chinese call it, within himself. This being is like the Taoist genome. It goes everywhere. It rides on the unicorn. It rides on the dragon. It is absolutely uh, free from fetter and bond. It achieves everything by becoming completely free of everything. It is the only free spirit in space. And it is the only thing that cannot die. Because death is always on balance and conflict. And if these two cease, there can be no death. So the diamond soul of Northern Buddhism, who supports the world, Vajrasattva, is the same thing, the same principle again. Buddhism has the same essential symbolism in the tremendous dynamic inaction of its religious art. <coughs> the majority of your Buddhist figures sit serenely upon the blossoms of a lotus. Half with their eyes half closed in complete posture of repose. Symbol of transcendent action. Symbol of the experience of Buddhahood. And representing to the Chinese consciousness the experience of Tao. Now when Tao has been established within the individual, and the inaction becomes dynamic from within. Every motion, every action, every manifestation of himself has to be with absolute rhythm. From that time on, anything that he touches becomes priceless because of the perfect energy of his own country. Anything he does, he does perfectly. An example of that is your uh, technique in your Zen in Japan, a painting, an art. When the Buddhists or uh, other religious artists decides to paint a religious painting, he doesn't get a model, he doesn't start in making sketches, he doesn't go through any of the procedure of the Western army to redo almost anything from chewing his pencils up and down. <coughs> The first thing that he does before he paints a religious subject is to realize that this subject must be released. It must express itself from within himself. Therefore, he begins by meditation. He stretches himself where he's going to use it. He sits down quietly in front of it and enters into an inner experience of life. And he gradually releases from his own consciousness, his own understanding of the thing he wants to paint moving it from within his own internal computer. He gradually visualizes onto this piece of stone the complete picture that he intends to paint. He does so without 
any effort, without any string of uh, without any question as to whether he's going to be right or wrong, he simply permits it to visually unfold, projecting his own internal contemplation and his own visual power as though it was a magic lantern, casting a reflection of a picture right onto this piece of silk. And in some instances, it has been known that the artist would sit and look at the piece of silk and meditate upon it for two or three years without taking so much as a piece of crayon or, or a, an ink slab in his hand at all. Then, having completed from within himself the full projection of his artistry, he suddenly takes his little brush, takes his little ink slabs, and in ten minutes the painting is finished. As one author said, it took him ten years and ten minutes to meditate. Everyone thought he worked on it for a long time. He worked for the ten minutes and he grew for the ten years. And the combination was a great work of art. This is the motion from within. This is the idea that the Chinese try to express it now. That it is the Tao, or the universal rhythm, coming out and finally possessing the individual that makes it possible for him with an infallible spell of his breath, which never needs to be corrected. In Chinese art, you never change a line or you never correct one. <coughs> it has to all exist within your consciousness, and even your hand has to be so accurate and so completely possessed by the picture that many Chinese artists, when the time comes to paint it, paint it with their eyes closed. And never have to change the mind. They have visualized this thing, and times have actually visualized. The great uh, Shingon monk in Japan, Kobo Daichi, has such tremendous concentrational power in this particular situation that he placed a brush between each finger of both hands, remained in meditation until he had completed the conduct of his picture. Get the brushes this way into ten different slabs, each one with a different shade. And with his eyes closed, painted the picture with ten brushes at one time. Because there was absolute concentration within his own consciousness. Now this is the stone, as far as China is concerned. This terrific power. This man can never be anything in this world. <laughs> because his own incredible internal can sustain him to anything. In India, a holy man going through the forest is seldom molested by an animal. Simply because his consciousness will not permit it. In the uh, Eastern Chinese uh, concept, the entire projection of this from within itself. Is so tremendous that it corresponds with what the Western alchemist calls projection. He uses the term, the European alchemist. That he is able to release the stone, release the dynamic, release the universal medicine through himself. There is also a story in China of a great artist priest who was called a chen to a man's state. And uh, after he had sat and watched the sick man for some time, this monk asked for a piece of silk. He steps before the sick man on a little frame such as they use for painting. And after watching the sick man for a certain time, the monk reached over, dropped his brush into the ink slab, raised the brush, and made a peculiar line on the silk, just one line sick man got well. Because the monk had captured the peculiar rhythm that was broken. And as the eyes of the sick man followed the rhythm of the line, it restored it internally. The fact is claimed to have done the same thing by striking one chord of common aloof. He was able to cure all kinds of sickness in that way. It was a symbol of the line. So uh, in Japan, also among the Zenju, uh, you will find the table or legend of the monk entering into meditation of the most profound nature. And in his meditation, he drew a door on a piece of silk. He started and watched it. 
and according to the story, visualized that door. Finally, he got up, opened it, and went through the silk to the door. Now, these things are, n- are no more remarkable than the idea that Roger Bacon was able to train to the two states by artificial gold that he manufactured the town of They're all parts of this story. The story which has been ridiculed because of its outward appearance to sheer fantasy. For the story it has to do with the entire internal life of the human being. A life which is controlled by the centralizing of consciousness. Uh, Daruma, the patriarch of Zen, uh, had an episode in his life that is a little reminiscent of the story we find in the New Testament. Daruma, in meditation, one day, was walking along by the side of the sea. And after he was long in his meditation, he suddenly sort of came out of this trance-like condition of ecstasy in which his mind was one with the infinite, and suddenly, to his amazement, observed that he had walked out several miles under the surface of the water. The moment he realized he was out there, he sank. But as long as his consciousness had been held in complete suspension, he didn't know it. He didn't see it. They also tell many similar stories about the power of this internal. Now, once he says this power is real, then it is possible to achieve this tremendous victory over the mind by the complete integration of the luminal part of the internal nature. This constitutes not only a victory over the world, but a victory over the great cyclic laws which control the activities of the unenlightened. Buddha is said to have risen victorious over the power of the seven planets. In the same way, the alchemist transmuting the seven souls which make up his psychic nature, and attaining complete transcendence over them, and causing them to form the diamond soul, or the great adept self achieves complete release from any limitation conceivable to the human mind or emotions. Therefore, he is completely without stress or strain. He is without tension, he is without new He is without any imbalance within his own nature. Therefore, like space itself, he is immortal. This was the Chinese concept of the transmutation, and I believe that the European concept under the symbolism, were practically identical. There is no question in the world that this symbolism moving into the news uh, influenced Arabic thinking, and much of our so-called chemical speculation came to Europe from Arabia and from Iran and from other areas of that general region. These uh, chemical and, and uh, physical chemical experiments are interesting for another reason. Which came first? Was alchemy the mad mother of chemistry, as some would have us believe? Or did physical chemistry arise from man's gradual recognition of great symbolical patterns within his own psychic nature? Is chemistry one of the expressions of the soul itself, interpreting itself through the symbolism of medicine and um, chemistry, and to a certain degree in philosophy and mathematics, all of which are involved in this subject? I am inclined to think that the alchemical symbolism arose out of man's own psychic recognition of these laws. And that man, attaining to a degree in sleep, the relaxing contention which he does not experience in daily living, that in sleep and dream phenomena he comes a little nearer to the threshold of this equilibrium. Sleep is probably a kind of equilibrium on a negative level. 
It is a kind of transcending of action. Therefore, sleep, death, initiation in the mystery, all these were always carried under one group of symbols. Sleep was always a symbol of death, death was always a symbol of initiation. <coughs> because it represented a transformation, a complete change of polarities. And in alchemy, the death of the night, the death of man's seven soul, must precede the resurrection. And from the, in the Christian alchemy, from the death of the seven souls arises the messianic soul. If you see this Christ rising from the tomb within the bottle of the alchemical experiment. If then we have this group of symbols all over the world, they seem to be trying to tell us that there is a strange and secret art, an art by which man may break this vicious circle of his own inadequacy. And whether we call this alchemy, or whether we call it Raja Yoga, or whether we call it mysticism or Sufism, or whether we believe it to be the religion of the dervishes, or Platonism, Gnosticism, or Orthodox, whatever we call it, it is all dealing with one thing, and that is the projection of the dying soul. And that this diamond soul of Alpha is the soul in each individual by means of which the individual becomes completely attuned to what uh, Lao Tzu calls Tao, or absolute equal uh, receptivity to universal energy. The universe around man, within man, is Tao. According to Lao Tzu, this universe is not only infinite life, but it is infinite wisdom, truth, love, law. It is not only all these moral things, but it is infinite nourishment, infinite supply, infinite availability. Everything that exists consists of Tao and nothing else, because there is nothing else. Everything that changes is Tao changing the stone appearance of itself. In its numerous and multiform appearances, Tao assumes to be many things, but it's in its essence it is one thing. Man, using the faculties which he has on the level of mind and emotion, looking at the universe sees many things but does not see Tao. Yet each of the many things that he sees is Tao. Therefore, he can say Tao is white. And he can also say Tao is red. He can say that it is sky and earth, that it is water and air. He can see it in the eyes of his child. He can feel it being within his own breast. All of these things are Tao. But because of his nature, this Tao is infinitely broken up. And he can also see the phenomena of two things outside of himself in war with each other. He can also experience two feelings or two impulses within himself at war with each other. Therefore, he experiences through the division of his own faculties Tao as infinite diversity. He comes to it on an Aristotelian point of view. He cannot see the tree for the leaves. He cannot see the city for the houses. He may go so far philosophically as to admit that all these houses are part of the city, and that all these leaves are part of the tree. But in consciousness, he is experiencing the many leaves and not the tree, because that is what the faculties reveal to us. He looks out and he sees 10,000 stars, but he does not see the one star. For well, that star must be born within himself, shining out of the east of his own soul. He sees all these things and he is profoundly moved by them. <coughs> and he says, God is wonderful. God is glorious. God is beyond estimation because God can maintain all these things. And that there is an infinite power somewhere that can keep these thousands of millions of worlds 
the radiant and rotating and revolving in their mysterious orbits in space. Therefore, we come to the concept of deity as infinite immensity, absolute power, tremendous authority. But always there is the star and the earth. There is the water and the moon. There is man, there is hunger, there is death. The man lives in this tremendous experience as within a great vessel. And he knows that he is living in a world of absolute energy. Yet he must work with his energy to transform it so that it will work in a combustion motor. He must work with it in another way in order that it shall work within his own body to maintain him. He is living in a world in which energy is available but must be constantly conditioned and changed. He finds it also possible to die of starvation in this world of absolute food. He finds it possible to die of ignorance in a universe of absolute wisdom. He finds it possible to die of loneliness when he is constantly in the midst of everything he lives. These are because he has not experienced God. Because he has experienced only the manyness. He has never experienced the tremendous dynamic of the dying self or the soul. So gradually, through the experience of manyness, he begins to recognize the necessity of reuniting broken parts. And he creates formula. The formula is nothing but a method of achieving an end, a scientific method for accomplishing a given purpose. So we have in these great esoteric systems like Buddhism and in the teachings of yoga, Vedanta, and Taoism, and many others, he has the disciplines the formulas for the shifting of this sense from manyness to oneness. From the experience of God at all, the experience of God as one. A one which contains the all. Or the experience from the experience of God as infinite action to God as inaction, which is the free action. Now, our concept of action and inaction is that when action happens, we're doing things. When inaction sets in, we're not doing things. The Chinese say that's no. That is yes. That's because we are looking at it from our level. The truth of the matter is that what we call action is the supreme inaction in space. And what we call inaction is complete action. Therefore, that the motion is not from action to inaction as positive to negative but from action to inaction as from negative to positive. The Tao and Tao alone is positive action. Why is it positive action? Because it is the only action upon which all things depend and which in itself depends upon nothing. Everything that lives lives because of Tao. And yet try and find Tao. Try to find this complete suspension of action. Try to find Tao as the teacher. It will never speak. Try to find it as the friend. You can never embrace it. Try to find it as nutrition. You can never put it on a plate and eat. Tao is infinite. Therefore, the experience of Tao is the experience of infinite. And the individual moving towards the free mind. Find that absolute action is absolute experience of infinite. And all else compared is inaction. Thus, internal action is supreme, and external action is comparatively unimportant. The only reason we have to run up and down is because we do not know where we are going, and would not know if we got there. Thus, it would the Tao is seeks this internalization. He's bringing together all of the disunity of his own psychic chemistry. He is reintegrating the seven souls to form the great soul. And he is then transmuting all activity, first into suspension of action, and finally to release through it Tao action. He tells signs or burns up or exhausts all of his own personal actions. 
And out of the ashes of this, by coming to Jesus, he causes the cloud of gold to grow. Or as in China, the little peach tree of gold, upon which are the blossoms and fruit of immortality. Out of the complete calcination of all of the negative aspects of action, he releases Tao through action. Tao is the tree. In the Chinese formula, when man ceases to make mistakes, the great virtue operates. And it cannot operate until he stops making mistakes. So, wisdom lies in ceasing to make mistakes. It doesn't lie in knowing all. It lies in no longer breaking laws. And then this state is reached. This state of equilibrium. Then the goal grows. The seed of the soul is quickened by the suspension of action or by the reconciliation of broken parts. And immediately it grows. Benny gives us the same story in the uh, Mysterium Magnum. The street of the soul, rising from the root of gold, is nothing but thou growing up from the seed of equilibrium in human consciousness. And when this has achieved and achieved, this, all, this tree also carries the twelve fruits which are for the healing of the nations. It is the tree of life. It is the sacred soma plant. It is everything which is for the nourishment of all that lives. But when this tree blossoms within the human soul, then we have the wonderful tree of the metals. We have the wonderful tree that is guided forever and guided within the secret garden of alchemy, in which there are many drawings and figures of the ancient books. And also, in a strange way, this is the very peach tree under which Lao Tzu was born. Because he said he was born under a peach tree. Well, now everyone uh, assumes uh, that this is merely a little historical episode gathered from somewhere. But the tree under which he was born is the tree of immortality of the Taoist paradise. And no one seems to have paid any attention to that at all. So that when he was born, they didn't name him Lao Tzu at that time, they named him little peach tree years. Because he had very large ears, he was born under the peace tree. <laughs> now, why did he have very large ears? Because Tao is in the very religion of very large ears and a very small mouth. Lao Tzu lived and taught for many, many years and left only 5,000 characters behind him to summarize his entire philosophy. Taoism is not a philosophy in which you uh, do a great deal of talking, it is a philosophy in which you are forever accepting into yourself not giving up. But in accepting into yourself, you prepare for the release of the splendor of a sun, for once this tremendous jewel of immortality is cast within yourself. You burst into a sun, and from that time on, your rays is warm and preserve all life. And you become the current of another order of life, and a new set, a new series of peach trees rise in the garden of immortality. And having achieved this, and having perfected oneself in it, according to the Taoist theories of the transcendental period, not the original period, also did not have this particular concept, but it followed in his teaching. After the achievement of this um, adequate, <coughs> after the wonderful mystery of the soul has been perfected, then the old Taoist adept goes off to seek the land of his brothers and lives forever with those, like himself, who have made the transmutations. Now in the Greek legends, I think we can <coughs> see pretty well what happens, what is meant. <coughs> For what happens when the Greeks achieve great catalysm and then die? Why, the gods always pick them up and make constellations up. They were always set in the sky, and therefore you have stars named for all the heroes and nymphs and all the wonderful beings. The crown of Semele was taken up after the <coughs> death, and the chair of Andromeda was taken up, and the winged horse Pegasus went up there. Everybody became a constellation after they had uh, made good, so to say, in whatever of their problem might be. So the old hours, that's when they got through, they went up to heaven and became stars. 
What is the star? Just another symbol of the diamond bowl. It is just another symbol of the radiant sun around which a new order of life is going to grow. Because when men cease moving around the center, they cease to be planets and become suns. When human beings cease to move around their own centers, they cease to be wanderers and they become sages. And as they become sages, they become alchemists. And sitting quietly within the mysterious nature of themselves, they take that little furnace which is the heart, which has the warmth within it, the point of fire and light, and in this heart they accomplish the creation of the universal medicine and the wise man's stone. But in the West, we have a lot of equipment to do that with, and they did even in the Middle Ages. Because we have never yet realized, as fully as the Asiatic has realized, how some of these things are, are and how always the symbolism is internal, regardless of the fact that we insist on building a laboratory and setting aside $50 million for the research. Then we think we're really getting things. And the Taoists, the British Jewists, out of face, although on the outside, being the Taoists, you probably agree with us, and chicken $4 to help build the laboratory. <laughs> <laughs> the it would be quite necessary to answer the pool according to his policy. <laughs> but in the alchemy itself, it is all this internal mystery of man ceasing to be a planet and becoming a sun, ceasing to be a base metal and becoming a star, ceasing to be a series of separate parts, each struggling for supremacy, and uniting these parts to their death and resurrection, that they may all become the vehicles or manifesting centers for the dissemination of Tao. For when this complete equilibrium is reached, and the silence and the mystery where all parts mingle, where the seven colors unite to restore the white light, in that center, Tao moves through. And moving into manifestation can transform man. For a planet is one who is moved to the sun, but the sun is one who moves the planets. And the spiritual source moves other things and is itself unmoved. But those who have not achieved this source are forever moved and have great difficulty in moving anything themselves. So with alchemy and the Chinese viewpoint, it is this creation of equilibrium and the release of the eternal. Going into the tree bears upon it the three great mysteries. Life, immortality, longevity, and eternal death. And this is the the great treasure. This is the treasure of the Arabian Night campaign. This is the treasure that all men come to see, into which they turn after all other treasures have faded. Now, as much as can be discussed about these subjects, but I think this is perhaps a little oriental slang on the Western subject and may help to make this a more rounded out uh, series of discussions. Well, I think, uh,